Now look, you need the mind of God. You need not just your normal access to the thoughts of God, but you need um, better access to the good and filtering out the bad. So you need a practice that's going to do that. Now, let me just poke in here. I think I found it with Kriya Yoga, that it gave me a practice that helped somehow filter out the inclination to do the bad habits, the bad thoughts. It, it, it screens those out. You have a propensity to bring in the good thoughts. Now, it may be because if you affect the breathing, you affect the emotions, which affects the mind, and what the mind is calling from God to think upon. I'm just suggesting that that might be an explanation. I don't know. But what I am saying is that, you know, the paramount of thing was, well, if you do these practices, you'll find that these things that you value so much now, you probably won't value them. They'll fall off increasingly. And I take that to mean, at the moment at least, the whole idea of such starts to vanish in importance and attractiveness and you're calling forth another way of life. I mean, by what would you would think was not a spiritual thing to do, but then you might think, well, what's so spiritual about not taking something I want? It's a very practical thing. I take it or I don't take it. How is that spiritual? But it is, of course, it's a way of life that if you don't steal um, in the world that we're in, that means there are property rights and you do get some form of civilization to live in. You know, you don't walk away from your house and it's automatically ransacked. So um, it is a, a very important rule, although it seems very practical. So don't be put off by things that are very practical. It might be very important, as, as Jordan Peterson says, that the young man gets up regularly at a certain time in the morning and he makes his bed. He doesn't just leave it in a heap. I actually leave mine open to air for a while, but, you know, the importance of order. Clean the place up. Introduce order. You can do that. That's no great hardship. You don't have to be employed or anything else to do that, but start to bring order into your life. It will have a profound effect. It will tell you, it will reveal to you the next step. You know, you might bring order into some of your ways and your habits, other than simply keeping a room clean or washing and shaving automatically. I mean, I don't mean you have to shave, but you know, um, you, you know, but you do do the things that make you socially acceptable. Um, you start to have meaning to life. You you seek out what the meaning is. You might, well, I presume if you're following Jordan Peterson, you might make sure you do listen to his advice each day. It may help you keep on track. I'm sure it would. Okay. So you're going to seek out those things start to give you the right access to God's mind so that the thoughts that come to you are a blessing. Now you see I'm puzzled by, in, in the previous recording I think it was, why I um, hadn't been able to carry on dictating as I used to when I switched to simply checking a gospel reference on the phone. I found that my um, recording stopped actually recording, I just got blank. It was continuing to run, but it wasn't recording. And uh, I thought to begin with, well, I thought somewhere in the mix, is it because I've got data saver on? But no, it wasn't that. It was that if I put the data saver, if I check it out, it gives me an opportunity to check um, which apps can continue to run in the background when you switch the screen off from that app. So I, I, I clicked down and found that, ah, there's um, my recording um, app, and 
I pressed it, selected it, and, and chose it to be continuously running in the background, even when I've got Data Saver on, which turns the other apps off. Now, that came to me when I just stopped, turned over and thought, oh, I hadn't mastered it. I thought it was, what was it that did it? What, um, what did I find worked earlier? Because it seems to be working even if I put the data saving, data saver on now. And I realized, oh, it's because, of course, I also made sure there was an exception from the list. Brilliant. You know, now what I'm saying is that the right ideas have come to me in my need. I just pause, turn over and think, well, I wonder what that problem is. What's that? I'm not consciously thinking, you know, God, give me the answer. But it comes. You know, suddenly I have a, I've been given an ability to seek out what I need from God's mind on the issue. Now, you may not see it that way. You may think, well, I don't know how thoughts come, but I don't think it's like that. Well, fair enough. But I mean, I'm just saying I do at the minute. I think there are things you can do in your life like fasting, perhaps. Well, like good company, for instance, so that you tend to have the sort of thoughts that come to you that are associated with good company, as opposed to the thoughts that are carried by bad company. It's almost the definition of good and bad company, isn't it? So the environment, human and uh, nature and so on, may be very significant in how you start to have access to God's mind or not. You know, we do good practices. Start the day with a, a reading, prayer, you know, start worship with, um, you know, service with worship. So you sing the praises and goodness of God. Your mind starts to get on track with all that's good and lovely and holy, you know. Spend your time thanking God. You're looking for the good. You're not looking for the bad all the time. And if you come across the bad, you may well start to say, well, I'm going to trust you for this, Lord, because of all your goodness. So you start to take a very positive approach to even the negative things in life. Quite fantastic. You see, there are simple practices that are a blessing. Eat the right foods, such a blessing. You feel good. Your body functions right. You sleep well. You're calmer. You're more peaceful. You start to hear God better. Simply by eating more carefully. What am I supposed to eat? You know, we're saying here in this last recording, uh, the importance in, in Mark 9 of... Um, prayer and fasting when it comes to having a ministry of authority with demons. Is that the equivalent of saying you have a more effective prayer situation, relationship with God, where you think or speak out and declare that in this case a demon is to leave this person? This dumb spirit is to come out. And it responds because you have a relationship with God that is your authority. You're not just a child of God. You start to speak with the authority of God because you're so in touch with his will. Nobody really knowingly wants to clash with God's will. That is not wise. <laughs> From a loving point of view, it's crazy because really he wants what's the best and you might not. And that would be madness to follow. It'd be best to follow what God wants. 
and from a fear point of view, of course, if you're demonic and you live in a world of fear, my goodness, you don't contradict what God wants. He may just leave you longer with pain and distress. You see, you obey. If what's being said to you is of God, as man of prayer and fasting is of God and does have his authority to cast out. And if you go against that, whoa, not a good idea. You see, something like that, isn't it? What do you think? Thank you, Heavenly Father. Oh, yeah, I mentioned uh, Kriya. Kriya Yoga. I mean, most Christians will cringe at the very word of yoga and anything from the East is suspect. But, well, of course, Christianity is an Eastern religion, isn't it? But uh, it's got westernized, of course. And um, it's not seen as Eastern now. Um, I mean, the roots of Christianity, and, and as far as they are Christian roots, are in Judaism, and, uh, and Judaism is, you know, Abraham came from Ur of the Chaldees. Um, you're getting pretty close to India there, um, Persia, and so forth. There are many branches of Kriya Yoga, but the particular one that I was taken with, because of the autobiography, uh, Paramahansa Yogananda, the particular one was that of um, one of his line of gurus, of course, which is basically, you know, spiritual teaching. And, um, He initiated people into Kriya Yoga, his particular understanding of it, whether they were Hindu, Muslim, Christian, or anything else. There was no requirement that you had to be Hindu, no expectation that you would shift religions. Um, you would practice your religion. It's a bit like having the right diet. I mean, the right diet's helpful and the wrong diet could kill you. Um, you don't want that. And his understanding was basically that you will avoid a great deal of misery and uh, suffering if you follow this practice. I mean, that could equally be applied to not eating the wrong things, couldn't it? You wouldn't sort of cringe at that, would you? So the question is, is it true? Now, I found it personally to be true. And um, one of the Beatles, was it George Harrison? He, he found it to be true too. And he, he, he said to um, Paramahansa, he said, uh, you know, well, does this mean if I follow your practice here, that I have to give up, um, well, basically white women and so on, you know, <laughs> put it a bit more um, crassly than that, but, um, and Paramount's response was, uh, no, you don't have to, you can practice it as you are, of course, but I don't guarantee that you'll continue to want to pursue your um, drugs and alcohol and women and so on as time goes on. Um, and George found that uh, his life was transformed, had meaning. He said, my life was a mess before. And it, uh, it obviously gave him purpose and all the spirituality that Paramahansa embraced. Paramahansa embraced Christianity, did a huge commentary on um, 
the Gospels, Life of Jesus. Um, now, obviously saw Jesus as an avatar, incarnation of God, which is a, a lot nearer um, acceptable Christianity now than uh, many Christians actually are. They don't really see Jesus as Son of God. Um, although the official line is that he now in Christianity that he is God. He's not just the Son of God, but he is God. And uh, the more fundamentalist persons definitely track down every possible indication that he's in the Old Testament as well as the New, but not by name, of course, except that the name Jesus is actually Joshua, and Joshua was the saviour of his people in a military capacity. Um, you know, he's the one that took over after, um, after Moses did not go into the promised land, whereas Joshua took him in. And Moses died. Or went to be with his fathers, or conceivably was translated, I suppose. According to the story. Now, when I say that I'm not a fundamentalist in the 20th century understanding of uh, evangelical Christianity. What I mean is that I'm accepting that religion is culturally biased, that scripture is not validated by some demonstrated historicity, but by its truthfulness, its validity turns on, does it work? Are you a transformed, more godly person by being part of a certain religion, a belief system, not a proved system? Even pure science understands that its understanding is not proved, simply not disproved yet, and seems to be the best explanation until a better might arise and be taken up instead. So the validity of scripture is in that it is found to be a blessing. And many people's religion is not found to be a blessing. And you can become a very unpleasant person by being very earnestly religious, dogmatic, narrow-minded, legalistic, punitive, um, very unloving. It's quite possible to be very seriously religious in any religion and still be like that. So there are certain practices within the religion that seem to avoid that and other practices that seem to result in that failure. Some practices seem to help in goodness. For instance, if you practice helping and being kind to others, that seems to transform you in a lovely way. That seems to result in a person that is loving and kind for real, a sheer joy to be with and a joy in themselves. Whereas people that don't tend to become narrower, more and more isolated and, well, chronically depressed. 
not a blessing to people and people avoid them like the plague. They're not a joy to be with. Now, I don't mean that religion is simply a case of pleasing man. Uh, I do mean that the validity of something is, does it work? For instance, you have principles that, um, you know, laws of motion and physics and so on, that in general seem to work. And based on those principles, you can develop the technology and machinery and so on that are incredibly useful. You might not know why gravity exists. You do know that it does exist in the sense that this relationship is as follows. You know, it's according to the mass of an object and distance that they are away from each other and so on and so forth. And you can predict and knowing this about your environment, you can do wonderful things. You know, the bird can fly without knowing how to do it. He knows he can fly. There's no question that he's proved it in some rational sense other than by doing. So the validity of something is not determined by who that person is. It's determined by whether what they are saying is a blessing or not. Now, some people it's true. Um, you're unlikely to get blessed by them because you know they're an evil intent. You know, they're in competition with you, so uh, they're not trying to help your business, so you don't want to go by their advice. <laughs> but that is not the point. What's the point is, is what's being suggested valid or not? Now, you might not even want to try and find out from some people because you just assume that everything they say is to down you and make life difficult for you. So anything they say is to be resisted like the plague. But um, well, that's going to restrict you greatly. And there's a tremendous number of people that you don't necessarily get on with or, you know, want to be partnered with for life. But their suggestions are very helpful. The way they do things that's different to you can be found to be a great blessing. And, and that's what we, we mean by trying to avoid prejudice. You know, the fact that you're from India saying spiritual things does not mean it's all black magic or something, okay? It doesn't mean it's all evil. Um, the fact that a person is secular, says he doesn't believe in God, doesn't mean to say he can't help you with certain problems in life. Nor does it mean he doesn't want to help you. So, you know, you shouldn't just write him off because he doesn't know God and therefore I'm not going to listen to him. He has to listen to me. That's not the way to go. You'll not be blessed by that. I listen to all people. I don't necessarily seek all people out. But I am sensitive to the ones that God brings into my life. And I try and listen, try and understand their view, why they think the way they do, what they think are the blessings, what they think is, you know, of value to them. You ask any person, just say to them, hey, if you had three books that you would recommend from your life's experience, what would they be? Well, I mean, the Christian always comes up with the Bible first, of course, but I mean, and what else? If it were 200 years ago, Next book would have been, for many people, Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan. <laughs> you know? Um, if you were of a certain age, you might even have come up with Gulliver's Travels. He had some astonishing insights, 100 or 150 years before his time, chap who wrote the book. In my case of a you know, rather broad um, experience compared to most Christians, I would say, well, of course, John's Gospel. 
perhaps the Gospels as well, but certainly John's Gospel. Um, and I might want to say, and uh, I mean, when I was a younger man, I would have said, oh, Omar Khayyam, reliant Omar Khayyam. There's a great deal of philosophical wisdom there that's helpful, helps you understand things. Um, from about 26, 25, 26 onwards, I would have said to you, oh, Paramhansa's autobiography of a yoga. And close on that, I would have said the Bhagavad Gita from the Hindu scripture, or from uh, Gandhi's understanding. The Gita s solves every difficult spiritual problem. It gives you the answers. Astonishing book. In the way that I think John's Gospel is too. Um, well, I've already come across your so books there, but do you see, take any individual and say, what three books would you recommend as being really important in your life, you know? And, um, well, you'd be surprised. There's a lot in those books that be a great value to you. There are some things you look at and say, oh, no, not that, because I'm clear and so and so, that's not my way. You know, I'm Christian, I couldn't do that. I wouldn't consider doing that. Uh, or I'm um, Anglican, I don't go in for um, deliverance ministries. That's, that's, I'm not, not in that, not in that. You know, and so you might be close-minded to various things. And uh, okay, that just means that you're not going down that road. You know, God has you going down some other way and um, your contribution to us all, maybe all the more for it. But do listen to people, do make sure you know what you're rejecting and why, not rejecting it on hearsay. All magic is evil, oh I have nothing to do with it. All fortune telling is evil, oh I have nothing to do with it. All so and so is evil, oh I have nothing to do with it. Pentecostalism, oh no that's not me. Mormon church, oh it has to be wrong. You know. I'm not talking to Mormons, no, no thank you. You can listen to my gospel, but I'm not listening to yours. That's not going to do it. And it's going to screen people out from coming to know you and your values too. Your, your values won't be on their menu if you don't talk to them. And if you don't listen to them, why should they listen to you? You know, you have to be listening in earnest. This person, God loves, is caring for them. They think this. Let's try and understand this. Let's really try and understand it from their point of view. I'm not here to tear it down. I am not here to change the world. I am here as an opportunity of certain spiritual things that I think and understand and have found to be a blessing. <laughs> and I would like to make those available to anyone that has ears to hear. But I'm not out there to change the world. See, now that's radically different to most Christians, isn't it? They're eternally wanting change. Lord, give me so and so. Lord, have so and so. Lord, heal me of this. Don't get me wrong. You can find that this is terribly important to you and therefore you're bringing it to God. I understand that. But basically, I'm not here to change the world. I am here to change things in me, so that I um, become more godly. And I have some idea of what that means as regards loving kindness and uh, devotion to God. And that is steering what I do take to heart, of course, from what I don't. Um, hmm. You know, when I say, well, yes, I, I appreciate um, the principle of loving God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength, I'm clear that I, I mean your God. Uh, you are to love your God, not someone else's. Um, when I 
say I accept that I should love thy neighbour as thyself. Well, it does imply that you do love yourself, doesn't it? It says something about self-interest. It's not all bad, especially when you apply it to others as well. You now know what you're doing. You know, you don't want to poison yourself, you don't poison others. Um, but I also take it that it does mean your neighbour, and the neighbour is well defined by the parable of the Good Samaritan. You should make yourself neighbour too, and as a neighbour you should be loved by the other person. And you should love your neighbour. Who has rescued you? They're the neighbour. Not the person you're talking to necessarily at the minute. Not the person who lives next door or across the street. He is not your neighbour in the spiritual sense. In, in Jesus' understanding, your neighbour is defined as the one who has rescued you in dire straits. You could have died, but for his goodness. And he didn't love you. Your neighbour doesn't love you. He simply rescued you, made sure you were rescued, and then went on his way. He didn't give his life to you, for goodness sake. You're not required. Then you couldn't possibly love everybody, could you? You don't have enough resources to share it around to everybody and make an iota of difference to anyone. In that case, you'd have to be prioritising your neighbour, when you prioritise and rescue someone that needs help, and you don't have enough resources, of course, to rescue everyone, and the person who's rescued should love his neighbour, the one that rescued him, as defined, that defines his neighbour. He should love that person that rescued him as his self. Do you see, so I'm not the usual fundamentalist Christian. Do I feel nonetheless I am Christian? Well, not if you mean fundamentalism in the usual... Um, I'm, I'm going to stick to the phrase 20th century way because 21st century Christianity is, is changing at, at, at a, quite a rate. Um, I am Christian in the sense that I understand what's consistent with, in the Jesus story, is basically valid. And I mean basically valid. I don't mean that scripture is so correct that it needs to be worshipped. Every line in it is truth. Every line in it is godly. You know, I don't find genocide and um, uh, curses and so on from God to his people because they don't keep the rules. The way to bring up children um, much of the Old Testament to me is very unacceptable. Much of it's a blessing, you know, even today. I uh, read something that was put to me in the Saturday Christian Fellowship I go to, which is in the Old Testament and has God saying to his people, um, how do I have you back? as my children, by you calling me Father and turning from your ways. You know, or if it's someone who's not really in the kingdom of heaven like John the Baptist, I mean, he's preaching the baptism of repentance. Oh, that sounds right to me. A person who's changed their ways, surely they should be forgiven. And God would forgive. You know, and if the rewards of being right with God are heaven, therefore, a forgiven person is going to heaven. Hmm. Makes sense to me. That doesn't mean to say that John the Baptist is in the kingdom of heaven. He's just got it right. He's got it right. And nothing to do with, you know, evangelical covering of the blood of Christ, you know, and perfect sacrifice having been made, etc, etc. Simply baptism of repentance. You start to start anew. Um, I don't 
doesn't mean that repentance is enough in itself to get you into heaven. You need a God that's willing to accept you and make heaven possible, just as you need God to make life on earth possible. If there's no earth, you can't have life on it, can you? And if you've no body, you can't mobilize the resources of earth to enjoy its benefits and blessings. You still need God. Um, and our trust is that God is, is there. He comes to the party. If you seek him earnestly, you seek his face. And probably, it seems in the dear Jesus teaching and some of the Old Testament teaching, that the way to do that was to own him as Father, your Heavenly Father, your good Father. And to turn, therefore, from doing what you know to be harmful, wrong, evil. It's not rocket science, is it? And anyone can do it. Anyone can do it who wants to. Anyone who wants to hear. You know, there's none so deaf as those that don't want to hear. <laughs> those who have ears to hear, let them hear. How wonderful. Thank you, Heavenly Father.